we're getting started in a good way. Man, he is not dead. He is alive. Yeah. They came to the tomb. So he's not here. He is risen. Amen. 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 And uh, we're glad that we serve a risen Savior this morning. And uh, we just want to celebrate him and honor him uh, with our praise. Amen. Amen. Let's go to the Lord's Prayer and ask him to bless our time together. If you're visiting with us this morning, we're so glad you chose to be here. And you're our honored guest. And we want you to keep coming back and plug into this community of believers. So let's go to the Lord and pray. Father God, Lord, we love you and we praise you. And God, we just thank you for the opportunity that you give us weekly. Lord, to come together corporately like we do to worship you and honor you. Lord, and to come and come in this place and to say, Lord, we want to hear from you, God. We want you to speak to us, do a work in our lives. God, so that not only would we commune with you here together, Father, but we would commune with you daily as we go about our lives. God, that our lives would reflect Jesus and that, Lord, people would be thirsty for the gospel. Lord, we're, we're living in a dark time. We're living in a, a wicked time, a troubling time. God, but for us, we're told that though there be trouble in the world, that we have peace in you. So, God, we have peace today because of Christ. And we thank you for Christ, and we celebrate Christ and his sacrifice and his resurrection. Lord, we just pray that Holy Spirit power would fill this place today. Satan would be bound and cast away from here. Lord, no evil work would occur other, uh, Lord, today that only your work would occur. No deception, no scheme of man, no plot of Satan. Only you, Christ, what you desire. Lord, be in this service in a mighty way. Lord, uncover the blindness of those who are lost. Lord, challenge us who are saved in our walk for you. We love you. We praise you. We need you today in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people say, amen, amen, amen. Let's continue to worship together. Let's honor him. He's worthy.
our content maybe isn't um, in church right now. That's why I was talking about people who are wavering. You know, that they have been led off by the lies of the enemy. So I want you to really think about who is someone right now that should be in this room that's not in this room. And we're just going to take a moment just to pray for that one individual. Okay? So think of one. Maybe you have more than one. Maybe you're like, I got a list. That's okay. But I can listen fast. So we're going to take a moment. Joey, you just play that chorus or something. And let's just take a moment just to pray for those people and ask God to just breathe on them right now wherever they are. Maybe it's wherever they're at. Maybe there's individuals, Lord, God, that, that we have on our hearts. God, we've wondered if they'll ever come back. God, we're claiming the victory right now over that. God, may you speak to them wherever they are. God, may they call them back to your side. God, many of us have walked away. God, you have so lovingly called us back. Lord, we pray for those people that weigh heavy on our hearts when they're not here. God, we ask for you to speak to them right now. Bring your Holy Spirit into the room where they are. And God, may they remember where they can come to see you and feel you. But God, they can see you and feel you where they're at. Lord, we ask God for you to bring them back. And we call for dry bones to come to life. It's in your precious, holy name we pray. Jesus. Amen. <coughs>
signal rather than a very bad.
things that were being taken in to their lives and going down into their heart because he said it was from in the heart that things were proceeding out of people's lives. In Mark chapter 7, verses number 21 through 23, it says, For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed the evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of coveting and wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. Jesus said all these th evil things proceed from within and defile the man. He said, uh, you know, you think that uh, all uh, what you're eating with unwashed hands is the issue they were having in that day? You think that that's defiling you? Do you think that that is what is destroying you? He said, no, what's destroying you is what's on the inside of you, and what's on the inside of you is eating you up, and as you try to suppress it, you're not able to overcome it in your own power, and it eventually comes out in sinful behaviors and patterns and the way you choose to live your life. God desires, listen, uh, we give a mixed message when we say we are one thing, and then inwardly we know we are something else. Else, God desires you. If you are a believer, remember we're in a discipleship series. I pray some people realize they're not disciples of Christ and turn their life over to Jesus Christ and get saved before it's everlasting too late. Hello? But I'm going to tell you something. There's some folks who are saved, and you need to understand this morning, that if you are feeding the old man, if you are uh, embracing things in your life, if you are sitting back upon the throne of your own heart, and you are beginning to uh, rule your own life again, then you are going to read the sinful pattern of behavior that you did before you got saved. I preach, preacher. I'm telling you, you tell them. God desires you to be a reflection of his son. Romans 8, 29, it says, For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the first born among many brothers and sisters. That he might be the firstborn, that he would have the preeminence, that he'd be first. Why? Because he is perfect, he is holy, he is righteous, he died for our sins, he rose from the dead, and yes, he is the first fruits of the resurrection. Amen? And we too, listen, one day, I don't know how it's going to happen yet because don't know what God's going to do. But one day after a while, we're going home. Whether we go home in death and we just pass on over into eternal life, whether he comes for his church. But let me tell you something. The Bible teaches that we're blessed if we have part in that first resurrection because the second death has no power over us. Amen? The Bible teaches in Romans 8, 29 there that God knew you in eternity past. Isn't that awesome to know that God knew you? Before he formed you in the womb, he knew you. He knew who you were. He knew everything about you. He knew what you looked like. He, he knew whether you wear glasses and what color hair you had. But he didn't just know those details about uh, the outward appearance. Listen, God knew who you would be. God knew. He saw your decision to put your faith in Christ in advance. And the Bible says that because God knows this and God chose us, that he has purposed and planned for us to be made into the image of Christ all the way to eternity past. Uh, you didn't come to Christ in faith one day and get saved. And God said, oh my goodness, I've got to do some work on that old boy or that old girl and turn her into something or turn him into something that'll be worth my while, that'll be worth my name, that'll bring me honor and glory. No, God saw you in eternity past. And he knows you. And he calls you by name. And he has a plan and a purpose for your life. Y'all just sit there. I'll, I'll have a spell all by myself. God knew you. He saw you. He purposed and planned. And as I study on this, I noticed some things in Colossians that helps our understanding of what God wants from us as we're being conformed to the image of Christ. Now, as, as I've been looking at this, God's allowed us to stay in Colossians, but this this principle of being conformed to the image of Christ is rooted in Scripture. It's in several places in Scripture, but I want you to get this this morning, okay? But number one, in order for us to conform to the image of Christ, it looks like this, your life deposited with Christ. Your life deposited with Christ. Now, I want you to think about this for a second. We talked about
about this a little bit last week about that uh, the scripture in verse 3 is related to uh, being placed in a crypt, being buried, being hidden away, much like Jesus was hidden away uh, in the tomb when he was crucified for our sins. But if you look this word up, if you look at this in verse 3, for you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. Now listen to me. If you are saved this morning, the Bible says you died and the life that you have is deposited, is hid with Christ in God. In other words, There is a heavenly transaction that takes place at salvation. We, we talk about receiving Christ into our heart. Let me, let me tell you something. God makes a heavenly investment in you when, he, when you trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. The Bible says if you have not the Spirit of Christ, you are none of you. You do not belong to him. He is not deposited the heavenly investment in your life. But now listen, when we get saved and Christ makes that investment in us, we in turn surrender our life as a heavenly investment. So God makes a heavenly investment in us and our response to that heavenly investment is, is God, my life is yours. I am depositing my life with you. I know that, Brother Jim. First three verses of Colossians chapter 3. What did he say there? He said, if you're risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Where is Jesus right now? He's in heaven. He's tucked away in heaven because he presented his blood sacrifice to the Father for the atonement of sins and he's awaiting the day when the Father says, Son, go get my children. says, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. You put your life in Christ. And, and so this word here, hid, when it says hid in Christ, or hid with Christ in God, it is telling us that we have security in knowing Christ. Our life has been placed into the hand of God. My life is invested in heaven. And thus, listen to me very closely, my heart and my treasure are as well. Jesus said, Matthew 6, 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. See, you can tell whether people are trying to build a life here or uh, if they are thinking about the eternal things of God. Where is their focus? What is, uh, what, where is their money going? Where is their time going? Where are their talents being directed? Are they being directed to build something here? Or are they being directed to build something of eternal value? See, if you're going to be the image bearer that God designs you to be, the Bible's telling us and teaching us here that we have to keep our focus on Christ. We have to keep our focus on Christ and, and, and we have to uh, make sure that what we're doing is that we're pursuing things that increase the heavenly investment that has been made. Are you following me this morning? I hope you are. Jesus told a parable, an earthly story to illustrate a heavenly truth. And he told about a master who had three servants, and he brought the master, uh, the master brought the three servants together, and he, uh, as he brought the three servants together, what he did was, is he called them together, and he deposited his money with them. One was given five talents, one was given two talents, one was given one talent. The Bible says that the man, the master, gave those people the investment based on their ability. God is not asking anything of you as a child of God that you are not capable of with the help of God. God is not calling you to something that is bigger, higher, more complicated than you can achieve 
God, with God's help. You can't do it by yourself. But he's deposited the heavenly investment based on your ability. <laughs> so he gives them these talents, right? What did he do? He immediately leaves, goes on a journey. And then he returns to reckon with those servants. What were they to do in the meantime? They were to take care of it. They were to deliver the increase to him at his coming. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. I know what I was, I know what I am, and thanks be to God that he saved me and he changed me, and I'm not who I used to be. And listen, I, I want to, when I stand before God one day, I want to be able to give an account for myself, and I've not been perfect, but I hope and pray that I deliver a good return on investment when I stand before my Father one day. Amen. You and I all ought to want to desire to give him his increase that is coming. Two increased the amount given. One buried it. One buried what, what did the master deposited with them. One buried it. Repressed their talent. But, uh, kept back from serving. Uh, stayed away from, from being involved. And if we were looking at it compared to church today, I, I, I'm just hanging out with the others who have their heavenly investment. And they're making a return for the master on the investment. I just hang out with those guys. I don't take the risk that those guys take. I don't do the things that those people do. I don't want just going to be me and Jesus. And one day I'll still go to heaven. He didn't lose it. He didn't squander it. But he didn't yield the master a return on the investment that was made. See, your life is deposited with Christ, and we should be living to produce an increase. Souls coming to the kingdom because they see Christ in you. Let me ask you something. People hung around with you for a day. Spent the day with you. Would they want to know Jesus more because of you? Would they hear you griping and complaining? Would they hear you talking about negative things and putting down things and not focusing on the things of God and building people up and doing what would be pleasing to Him? What would someone see if they were to capture a life for a day? Would they be coming to Christ or would they be running from Christ? I'll be honest with you. I know some people who profess to be Christians. That they're running people from Christ by their attitudes, by their conduct, by the words that they speak. They're running people from the cause of Christ. You and I have had our lives deposited with Christ and we're to shed the old man. We're to die to who we were. We're to embrace the newness. We're to walk in a way that will bring eternal value to not only what we're doing, but to the honor and praise and glory of God Almighty. Yeah. Life deposited with Christ. You'll be conformed to the image of Christ. You've got to deposit your life with Christ. You want to be conformed to the image of Christ. Your life has to be conducted as Christ. It's not even just, I want this picture. It is that I begin to take on the attitudes and the, the values and the, and the sacrificialness of Christ. I, I begin to literally, literally, I begin to walk out my life looking more and more like Jesus. Your life conducted as Christ, Colossians chapter 2 and verse number 6. You remember this probably from week 1 when we were talking to this a uh, particular passage of Colossians 2 about developing convictions in our life. But here's the other thing we see in verse 6. He says, as you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord. There's that heavenly investment. God's made a heavenly investment. I have received Christ. Well, I'm glad I found Jesus. You didn't find him. He found you. You went astray, you lived in rebellion, you chose your way, you chose to live in the deeds and the ways of the old man, you chose to live in the flesh, you chose to live the life of Adam. And what did it bring you? Sin and death. But then one day you came into the convicting power of the Holy Spirit, you realized that you were a sinner, that there was no way back to God except through Jesus Christ. 
Christ. You trusted Christ. And you received Christ. When you didn't go find Jesus, he found you. See, but when you, when he comes to you and he convicts you and you determine to go with him, he takes up residence within you. And the word says then, walk in him. It's this picture that we have when Jesus is calling the first disciples to himself. And he says, follow me. And immediately they leave everything. They didn't think about home. They didn't think about careers. They didn't think about anything other than the fact that the master said, follow me. And so that meant literally get in behind him and walk where I walk, go where I go, do what I do, sleep where I sleep, learn to live as me on this earth. Right. Oh, I don't know if that's what that's talking about, Brother Jim. It tells us in the word of God that when we follow after someone in discipleship, when we, when, when, when we, Pursue a master. Jesus was master to them. That when you are full grown, when you reach maturity as a child of God, that you become like your master. So if we are mature in Christ, we will be like him. He said, follow him. He said that to his first disciples, but what else did he say? I've been reading the New Testament. I'm working through a plan. I hope you're working through plans. Uh, reading the Bible in a year with us, that's great if you're doing that. Uh, find something to do. Even, even if you just choose to read through the New Testament this year, get in the Word of God every day. But I'm telling you, as I read the Word of God, man, things, uh, things I knew jump out to me, new things jump out to me. I'm like, wow, look at that. Look what God said there. Look what God's doing there. But in this thought of follow me, you know, we, we so often talk about how he came along and, and he looked at them and he said, follow me. Peter and them followed. But you know what? There's another place where Jesus looks at them and says, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. You won't be catching fish anymore. You're going to, from this point forward, you're going to catch men. think that these big old fish are trophy fish. There's nothing more than to know that there are trophies for the glory of God raised up in heaven, laid up in heaven there where, where no one can take them away. Where Jesus says uh, that moth and, and rust do not corrupt and thieves don't break in and steal that those treasures are deposited in heaven. <laughs> Victory's won. Lives change. People coming to know Christ. People leaving behind the old man. You know, if you look this word up, walk um, in the original language, in this specific instance, it means this, to live a life conformed to the union entered into with Christ. Literally, Paul is saying, be conformed to the image of Christ in this text. 1 Corinthians 15, 49. It says, and just as we have borne the likeness of the earthly man, so shall we bear the likeness of the man from heaven. We all are born into the image of Adam. We all have lived the life of Adam. We had no problem living in sin and death. So I had plenty of problems while I lived in sin and death. No, but you didn't have to struggle to be able to do it. Your body, your flesh naturally is bent towards sin. But here, Listen to me this morning. Are you listening? Say we're listening. Here, the child of God in this text is the ultimate dare of the enemy. The ultimate dare of the enemy. You say, well, it's in God's word. How is it the ultimate dare of the enemy? The enemy is daring you to be as Christ in the world. The devil is saying, you won't do it. You won't make the sacrifice. You won't make the choices. You will not do it. You are like you used to be. You've still got flesh. You're going to turn back. You're going to quit. Uh, everybody's going to know what a joke you are. The devil's a liar. What does it look like to conduct your life as Christ? Listen to me very closely. 
People don't like talking about this. People don't like talking about this in church. Because this word means there's a cost. I'm going to tell you, I'm not, I'm not God. I can't be everywhere at once. I can only be one place at one time. I'm not God. I'm not all powerful. I can't, I can't change people or change things in my own power. I can plead with God to change it. You follow me? I can plead with the one who has the power to change it to do it. But listen to me very closely. If you're going to be conformed to the image of Christ, it's going to require sacrifice. And that's not a popular word because it means there's a cost attached to it. Let me tell you something, though. You read the scriptures and you search the scriptures out and you will find that Jesus promised you you will not sacrifice anything on this earth that you're not going to get back a hundredfold. Well, I, I've, got, I've got to spend time with my family, but just, me too. Make sure they're going to heaven and you can spend eternity with them. Right. Where time will never run out and you'll never have to be a part. And you'll never have to worry about running to this place or that place to minister someone who's on their way to hell. Because when we get to heaven and all of life is over and everything is said and done, we shall be with him and we shall worship him and we will never, ever depart from him. Right. You better deposit your family in heaven so that they'll be there with you one day. Whatever you treasure the most on this earth, you better give it to God. Being as Christ requires sacrifice. In the book of 1 John, it tells us. Well, if you look it up, it'll be 1 John 3.16. He laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. He laid it down. He died to death. Not only did he die to death, he, he, he constantly was pouring in to other people. I, I was reading this week, and, and the disciples had been out. Man, they had been witnessing for Jesus. He'd sent them out. And man, they were seeing some fruit from going out and preaching Jesus. And they come back to him, and they're telling him all about all the things that had happened. And he said, hey, come over here. We need to come apart for a minute and pray. We need to, you need to come over here and rest a little bit. They tried to go and rest, and you know what happened? The multitudes came to them. I know some of you are tired. I know some of you are taking on more things than you can imagine. Trying to serve Christ. And I wish I had the answer to be able to say, hey, here's what you do, and, and this is how you can do it. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. You need to prioritize your life. You don't need to get rid of the things of God, though, from your life. You may have to cut some other things. I don't watch as much TV as I used to watch, folks. I don't even listen to the radio as much as I used to listen to the radio. I'm not as involved as in many organizations outside this church as I was before. Because I had to prioritize my life. Things that are, are were important to me are not as important to me anymore. God and my family are two of the most important things on this earth. Sacrifice. It requires compassion. He was moved, the Bible tells us, he was moved to compassion at the sight of multitudes. He was moved to action at the needs of those he encountered. People needed him. <laughs> he met them where they were. He met the need that they had. And they had their faith in him. That's why the healing power could go out from him. Do you understand that? He did not need any mighty miracles there because of their unbelief. But in other places they believed. And listen, because they believed him and had faith in him, he did the work in them. Yeah. Think about the centurion sending for his servant's well-being. 
They're coming, they're coming. Jesus is coming to that man's house. And the man sits back and says, you don't actually come under my roof. He says, I know. Because I am a man who had people under authority just like you. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and come, and he comes. He says, you say the word. <laughs> Jesus said, you've never seen faith like that. Let me tell you something. You need to understand that God wants to work through you. And when you see a need, you need to trust God. And follow through. It requires a zeal for righteousness. Do you want to be righteous? Do you want to live your life in a way that it would honor God? Do you want to be rid of the sin and sorrow and shame that has been all over your life? Do you want it dealt with and done for? Listen, you have to have a zeal for righteousness. He had a zeal for righteousness. The Bible tells us he was tempted at all points like as we are yet without sin. Folks, we mess the image up when we conduct our life as Adam rather than as Christ. Your life deposited with Christ. Your life conducted as Christ. Your life pleasing for Christ. Your life pleasing for Christ. Back in the first chapter of Colossians, verse number 10. That you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Folks, we don't need just discipleship, we need followership. It's good to sit around and disciple one another. It's good to do Bible studies. It's good to grow in the knowledge of the Word. And listen, if you aren't growing in the knowledge of the Word in this church, that's your own fault because there's too many opportunities for you to partake of in order that you might grow. So if you don't feel like you know enough about God after sitting here at church, then you need to come back on some other times when this building's open and get plugged into some groups. And I'm going to tell you something. God will increase the knowledge of himself within you. Amen. Let me tell you something. Discipleship's great, but followership is better. When we take what we've learned and we apply it to our lives and it becomes fruitful, when righteousness is flowing from us, when we take what we've learned and we carry it out in the lost and dying world, I remember my daddy praying. I remember my daddy praying as I was a young boy growing up in church, and I always listened to what people were saying when they were praying. And one of the things I can remember, I can't, I can't hear my dad's voice anymore praying those prayers. I don't think there's a recording of my dad praying. But listen, that's one thing I wish I had, but listen to me. I can remember my dad saying all the time, if it was before a message, he would say, God, let us take something from this message that we can apply to our lives or carry out in the lost and dying world. If it was after the message, he would say, God, I hope that we've taken something from this that we can apply to our lives or carry out in the lost and dying world. But both times it was, listen, I, I want, to, I want the, what, that truth that has come to me, I want it deposited in my life and I want it to help me reflect Christ. I want what was deposited in me to come out this week. When I talk to somebody, let me tell them the truth of who Jesus is. <coughs> We're called to be pleasing to him. It says that we walk worthy of the Lord. Well, the Lord is inside of you. He's living in you. We want to honor his sacrifice. We want to honor his life because he traded his life for our life. He took our sin, our sorrow, our shame on that cross. And so we want to honor his life so we walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing means that we be pleasing in everything. Is it your desire to be pleasing to God in everything? And if it is in fact your desire to be pleasing to God in everything, do you position yourself to be pleasing? Because it's one thing to say, yeah, Brother Jeff, I want to be pleasing. God, I want to be pleasing. It's an entirely different thing to position yourself to be pleasing. To sit down with God and say, okay, God, I'm laying all my cards on the table. He's like, good, go ahead and get that other one you got hid in your pocket and you need to tell me about. He said, okay, okay, now all the cards are on the table. God, 
God, what do you want from me? God, what is it in my life that has to change? God, what is it in my life you want me to do to honor you? God, where is it you want me to serve? Where is it you want me to make a sacrifice? Do we position ourselves to be pleasing to him? Or are there times, listen to me, that you want to still have control and you still want to call the shots over your life? Your ways are not going to be his ways. Your life will not be his life. Unless you choose to position yourself to be pleasing to him. Choosing to be pleasing to him looks like choosing a life of obedience. Christ chose to be found pleasing the Father in all things. In John 4 and verse number 34 it says, Jesus said unto them, My need is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. His focus was on accomplishing the Father's will. Think about this. The Father calls out from heaven in Scripture. Don't you just love that? I don't know about this trinity thing. I love it. I'll tell you why I love it. Because I can prove it. Jesus got baptized. You know what happened? The heavens opened up. The Father said, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. You know what happened as the Father said, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased? The Holy Spirit descended like a dove and landed on him. What? Oh, John the Baptist testifies, says, you'll know who he is when the Spirit descends on him in such a way. So the Father called out from heaven, the Spirit descended like a dove, and the Son was standing in the water, identifying with mankind. He wasn't being baptized because he was sinful. He wasn't being baptized because he needed to be baptized because John the Baptist said, I have need to be baptized with thee. Jesus looked at him and said, it cometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Yeah. In other words, Jesus went in the water and was baptized to identify with mankind. Yeah. He didn't need to be baptized. He needed to demonstrate that he had become like us so one day we could become like him. A lot of people are waiting to get to heaven to become like him, and that's not what the scripture teaches at all. Father doesn't teach that you're going to be like Jesus when you get to heaven. Yes, you'll be like him there. The Bible teaches you to be like him there. Amen. The Bible teaches that he chose you and he ordains you. <laughs> that he calls you with a holy call and he has a plan and a purpose for your life. If you live it out, it's a reflection of him. How do you live it out? In both Christ's baptism and his transfiguration, we see the Father call out, This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. You know the other person in Scripture identified as the beloved Son? Isaac. Take your beloved Son and sacrifice him. See, beloved Son is, is equated to the sacrificial son. Abraham was going to take Isaac up there and he was going to kill him because God told him to. But he, the Bible tells us that, that Abraham believed God that he was able to raise him up from the dead. And so he goes and he raises the knife to slay Isaac. God stops him. Substitutes the sacrifice. A picture of the substitutionary sacrifice that would come with it. Jesus comes along and he's baptizing John and heaven's opened up and what does it say? This is my beloved son. The father says, this is my beloved son. Whom I'm well pleased. Jesus said there were going to be some people that day who were standing there later on in his ministry. He said, there's people standing here and I'll taste dead until they see the son in all his glory in his kingdom. A few days later, he takes his inner circle up on the mountain. get up on the mountain, Jesus immediately is changed into the glory that's coming. They're looking at him astonished. Peter's like, we need to build, we need to build three tabernacles here because appearing with him was Moses and Elijah. Father says again, He also says something else at the Mount of Transfiguration. He says, Hear ye them. You need to hear from Jesus this morning. You need to hear from him. What 
does he need you to do that you might be, be found pleasing to him? What is it that you need to do to align your life to the mission of why he was on this earth? Because he aligned his life completely to the mission of why he was on earth. And he wants us to do the same. He was touching people physically, spiritually for the glory of God. And listen, you have a decision to make and I have a decision to make. Will we serve ourselves or will we serve God? There's an old song. Some of y'all heard me talk about this song before. I am satisfied with Jesus. Part of that song, it says this, I'm satisfied, I'm satisfied. I'm satisfied with Jesus. But the question comes to me is I think of Calvary. Is my master satisfied with me? Friend, how do you need to adjust this morning your life to conform to the image of Christ? There's probably somebody here this morning needs to get saved. You need to just be honest. You've never really been saved. Your life's never really been transformed. And all you can do is come in faith to Jesus Christ and say, you know what? It's yours. It ain't much, but you can have it. And God says, that's okay. I'm going to make a heavenly investment in you. And I know you're going to bring me honor and glory by the way you live your life, by the gifts you reach, by the lives that are changed, by the discipleship that you help be a part of. I know that you're going to make a difference for me. Though you ain't got much of an investment to make, he's willing to make an investment in you. And once he makes that investment in you, guess what? He gets a return on that investment. Your life lived for him. Your life, a picture of Christ. Your life bringing others to the fold. Don't wreck the image. Don't, don't live like Adam. Live like Jesus. Don't live like the old man. Live like the new man. The new man, what did the Bible tell us last week? In verse number 10 of chapter 3, it says, Put on the new man, which is renewed knowledge after the image of him that created him. The Bible says that nothing has been made without Christ. He, was, he is the Word. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And it tells us all things that were made were made. Show his praises to honor and glorify him through our life. So this morning, has your life been deposited with Christ? Has your life been conducted as Christ? And today, presently, is your life pleasing for Christ? I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes this morning. Nobody looking around. God's dealing with your heart this morning. Would you respond to that decision? For somebody here, it may be to finally own up to the fact that. I've never really been saved. I've never really gotten to the place where I confessed Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And He came into my life and He changed my life. <coughs> he forgave me of my sins. And it was no longer I that was living, but Christ in me. And listen, no matter who you are, no matter how long you've been playing the game and putting on the facade, today is the day of salvation. And one of the hardest things for me to do the night I got saved was to admit that though God had called me, <coughs> I didn't want to answer because of what I would be saying. I would be saying I wasn't really saved. I would be saying that my call to preach initially was, was not of God. I would be saying that people who, who had gotten saved had gotten saved under the message of a lost person. Listen, I'm glad my words don't say it. I'm glad it's the words of Jesus that say it. <clears throat> Jesus said, you're going to go away also? Peter said, where we go? You alone have the words of life. Jesus alone has the words of life. I'm just a vessel to preach his message. He saved me. That night I got saved, I had to lay down my pride. I had to forget what anybody else might think. I had to just think solely on what Jesus was saying to me. And that my eternity hung in a balance. And I got saved. Three months later, he called me to preach. Man, I wrestled with that. I didn't want to do it. I thought, man, getting saved, that got me out of that. No. No, Jesus had a plan and a purpose. The 
today are you saved? If not, would you call on Jesus? The Bible says, Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans 10 verse. Ephesians 2 8 9. For by grace you saved through faith. That not yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's by faith alone in Christ alone, because of his grace that you're able to get saved. <clears throat> Trust him today. Ask him to save you. Come to him right now. How do I come to him in prayer? I don't know how to pray. Go guard your heart just like you tell the person sitting next to you. Just like you tell your friend, your neighbor, your mama, your daddy, your brother, your sister, whoever you normally talk to, listen. Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. What about you, child of God? You've deposited your life with Christ. Are you conducting your life as Christ? Are you saying make more of me? Or are you saying make less of me? John said that he had to decrease. John the Baptist said he had to decrease so that Christ could increase. Christ needed to increase. Today, for some of you, you need to decrease. For me today, I need to decrease. But you know what needs to happen? Not just less of me, more of Jesus. Give me more of Jesus. More of Jesus. It's like that song we sing sometimes. Give me Jesus. You can have all this world, but give me Jesus. Is your life can be for this morning. It can be. Choose you this day who you will serve. As for me, my house. We made that decision. We're going to serve the Lord. In whatever way He tells us to, we're going to serve the Lord. Father, would you speak during this time of invitation? Call all speak with salvation. Lord, those who are saved, God, shake us this morning so that we will walk differently this week. Amen. Would you stand to your feet with your heads bowed, eyes closed? Listen, this morning, from your perspective, Brother Adam's on your left, Brother Matt Reed's on your right, and I'll be right here in the middle. If you're coming for salvation this morning, would you come? Would you come, would you come to one of us? You, I'm not comfortable talking to you, Brother Jeff. Then we'll get somebody you are comfortable with, but come to one of us and say, Brother Jeff, I want to be saved, Brother Adam, I want to be saved, Brother Matt, I want to be saved. Come say, I want to be saved this morning. You so I've already asked Jesus to save me at my seat and come reveal that decision. I've asked Jesus to save me this morning. Let us rejoice with you. Let us pray with you. Let us encourage you this morning. And I'm going to ask you, heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Who did that this morning? Who asked Jesus to save them this morning? And you would lead the way to this altar this morning. You would be the first to step out of your seat, walk forward, and say, I receive Christ this morning. Christ has, has, has dealt with my heart this morning. He's, he's trying to make a heavenly investment in me, and I'm coming to him this morning. Who is it will be first? I did that this morning. Anybody? Anybody in this room should choose Jesus this morning. Who will be first? Anybody? Child of God, if I spoke to you this morning, what's he asking you to do? Will you obey his voice? Will you harden not your heart today and obey his voice? How's he going to respond? Child of God, who will come? Who will come? Say, begin to play yourself. Who will come?
Anybody else need to come? This is your chance. Anybody else? We don't want to finish before God's time. But if you are coming, you should come. It's like that old Ray Bolton song, The Invitation. It said, Come quickly now before they close the door. God's invitation always open. Yeah, I believe that. I believe you get saved anywhere, anytime. I believe you can talk to God anywhere, anytime. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Melissa talked about this last week. There's scripture written all over this place. There's Bibles in the wall. There's, there's scripture on the, on the two and fours in the wall. There's, there's the, this place is covered in the Word of God. I'm going to tell you something else. This place is covered in the Spirit of God. You know what the Bible says where the Spirit of God is, there is liberty. There's 